Hey everyone, my name is Riley and welcome to the Jams and Tea channel. Today I'm hitting you with a solo video where I'm going to be discussing and ranking the discography of one of my favorite bands of all time, the emo, pop punk, alt rock, power pop, legends, institutions, stalwarts, Jimmy Eat World. The way this is going to happen is I'm going to count down all 10 of their studio albums from worst to best with the caveat that this is a band I love so even with their weakest records I think there's still something worth celebrating. I think they're a great band and all of this comes from a place of genuine love and adoration of this band who particularly in the last year or so though they've been a fixture in my life since I was a teenager they've really come to take over uh, a lot of my listening and um, they've come to mean a really huge amount to me so this is a labor of love and I hope that the Jimmy Eat World fans out here enjoy what I have to say and my ranking but if you disagree if you have any bugbears complaints additional thoughts I genuinely would love to hear from you in the comments below. Let's have a discussion about Jimmy Eat World. Let's talk about why this band is so great. And let's debate some of these picks. Um, but yeah, let's get into it. Without any further ado, uh, all 10 Jimmy Eat World studio albums ranked from worst to best. And at number 10, the weakest Jimmy Eat World album is of course... <laughs> The 1994 self-titled Jimmy Eat World debut is pretty scrappy, unremarkable, jawbreaker worship for the most part. The band are definitely quite capable and in sync here, but there's not really much sense of identity in any of the music. The tracks sound like demos, and it's not hard to see why the band have made no attempt to reissue this album or to make it available on streaming services. They've essentially gone out of their way to try and erase its existence, and when you hear it, you can kind of understand why. There are some moments that show a little promise, though, like the more developed soar of Patches, the chugging strut of Splat Out of Luck, the string-accompanied outro of Usury, and the instrumental jam of Scientific, but all of these are more just flashes of potential as opposed to actual moments worth preserving. The band would go on to refine this more punk adjacent variant of their sound very soon anyway, so I would say that the 1994 self-titled debut is really only one for the completionists. If we discount the self-titled, Damage is comfortably the worst main Jimmy Eat World album. Though it's not a catastrophic failure, it's more a mixture of less inspired songwriting, more mundane hooks, and by far the worst production of any of the band's major label releases. That said, it's not a record without effort. Adkins has clearly put thought into the album's concept of tragic and downbeat love songs. I think he termed it an adult breakup record. It starts off inoffensively enough with the three strongest tracks all placed at the very top of the album. The title track is a highlight featuring the record's best hook and Lean has one of the most explosive solos of the album, although it is somewhat hindered by the unpleasantly flat mix. Lead single, I Will Steal You Back, has a decent hook too, though it's around this point in the album that its production issues really come to the fore. This is compounded by the songwriting taking a notable downturn and the insipid and endless feeling Please Say No, which feels like a rehash of Invented's Stop. Bye Bye Love is probably the most plodding song Jimmy Eat World ever put on an album, and You Were Good is, along with the self-titled album's Cars, an exceedingly rare example of a weak album closer from Jimmy Eat World. It's pretty safe to say that for the rest of this list, every single closer is a clear album standout. 
Unfortunately though, Damage takes the mantle of their most inessential main studio album and can be safely skipped unless you're really interested in hearing every Jimmy Eat World record. At this point, I want to make it totally clear that the self-titled album and Damage are the only two records this band have made that I find it a genuine chore to make it through. And so, their latest album, Surviving, ranking this low on the list should not be misread as an indictment. This is a strong album, and one that I only enjoy more and more as time goes by. It is admittedly slight, but this is both a weakness and a strength. Depending on how you look at it and depending on what you want from a Jimmy Eat World album at this point in their career. Following the dazzling soundscapes of the rich Integrity Blues, this is a much more stripped back album. Deliberately unassuming, but its straightforwardness hardly reads like a band out of ideas, and more a band simply having fun, banging out a few explosive and catchy, if less dynamic, tunes. Surviving's weakness, if it has one, is that it is admittedly one of the band's more two-dimensional records in this sense, and the shtick wears thin a little more quickly than on many of their previous albums. It's also considerably front-loaded in my estimation. The title track brings the album roaring to life with one of their most adrenaline-pumping builds in some time. Criminal Energy keeps up that pace with one of the album's best hooks. Delivery has some nice shuffling drums and jangling emo tones that immediately signal classic Jimmy. 555 is a piece of experimental, synthetic, and minimal pop that's probably the album's most divisive moment, but I'm a huge fan personally. Uh, it's a clear standout, and while it might alienate fans who prefer the band at their most explosive and unadorned, I'm a big fan of when they get the polish out and explore these slicker, more electronic textures. The best song on the album, however, is the glorious power pop of One Mill which has some of the album's most anthemic vocals and its best hook, as well as a genuinely fiery climax. I'm not as huge on All The Way, which leaves less of an impression despite its surprise sax solo, which sounds too kind of cardboard and flat for me, especially when you're talking about an album that was produced by the same guy who produced M83's Midnight City, which has the greatest sax solo of the 2010s on it. The album does finish strong though, with Recommit and Congratulations, the former would fit right in on Futures, and the latter is a, the requisite lengthy closer where the band flex their instrumental muscle and leave the album on a strong note. I'm sure some OG fans out there will chastise me for not placing this higher, but just know that I have a lot of fondness for this album, and it has grown on me considerably since I first heard it. I think for a long time it just really stood in the shadow of Clarity as the most similar album to that record in their discography, but that comparison I guess has always been unfair because this album has plenty of raucous punk energy of its own and sticky Jimmy Eat World hooks and vocal harmonies more than enough, in fact, to make for a satisfying major label debut. Thinking That's All is of course a classic opener for the band, energetic, slick and noisy. Rockstar is one of their first truly great songs and has some super sunny day real estate energy in its melodies, emo jangle and Tom Linton's elongated croons. Clear is even better. Perhaps the album's first display of how genuinely pretty this band can be without sacrificing the rawness of their sound in this era. Lead single Call It In The Air is an early classic for the band, and probably the best example of the sound of this record and the strengths of the band in this nascent phase. It would slot right into the punkier first half of Clarity, which is no faint praise coming from me. The rest of this record is not quite at the level of this opening salvo, though only a couple of songs really truly miss the mark for me. And there are a couple of late album highlights, including my f personal favourite song on this album, the underrated deep cut In The Same Room, 
which is one of the record's moodiest moments, but features some powerfully strained vocals from Young Jim and a gorgeous, pure emo tonality that masterfully balances tenderness and pain. This album has probably been the biggest grower in the band's discography for me. As when I first heard it, I just didn't really care for it at all. The polish of a record like Chase This Light is something I welcomed when backed up with the intense, fast-paced instrumentation and razor-sharp songwriting. But by comparison, Invented is the most sprawling and least structurally cohesive Jimmy Eat World album, and still definitely a step down somewhat from their wonderful 2000s run. It took me a while to adjust to the shift that this album represents into a less intense and more mature iteration of the band, more clearly preoccupied with the interests of the aging Jim Adkins, who, it's clearer than ever, is no longer the 20-something kid he was when the band first blew up. Almost entirely rooted in power pop over emo, the album features exercises in songwriting inspired by creating stories about figures and decontextualized photographs. This results in an album less immediately personal than some of the band's most beloved records, but one that has aged surprisingly well, I think. In looking outward rather than inward, it definitely showcases some of Edkin's limitations as a songwriter. But the band buoy him with energetic aplomb, in songs like the lead single, My Best Theory, the stadium-sized Evidence, the impassioned and urgent Little Thing, and the underrated Action Needs an Audience. The peaks of the record, though, are in the one-two punches that sit at its center and at its conclusion. At the heart of Invented are two total gems for the band, the soaring movie-like and the pretty surge of the heartwarming Japandroids-esque coffee and cigarettes. The closing duo of this record, by contrast, are two much slower and lengthier tracks, each about seven minutes, giving the record a gorgeous and surprising come down. The title track is delicate and restrained, until it isn't, and closer mixtape is similarly minimal but much harder hitting. Jim's repeated refrain of, you don't get to walk away now, can be read as an impassioned plea to an estranged friend or lover, or as words of encouragement directed inward. And either way, like all of the best Jimmy Eat World album closers, it's hard not to feel a lump in your throat as it rises, crests, and then falls away. It's a suitably formless ending for a strange record, one which may have seemed destined to be forgotten, but has held up as a quiet mid-career standout in my opinion, destined to be rediscovered and reevaluated with time. Talk about a reinvigoration. Jimmy Eat World's first team up with M83 affiliated producer Justin Meldel Johnson came at just the right time for the band. After the staid and somewhat uninspired production of their previous albums had left many people without much hope for Jimmy Eat World. Integrity Blues sees them sounding sharper, more vibrant, and crucially more excited about making music than they had in many years up to this point. And it helps that the batch of songs they brought into the studio were largely excellent. When the synthetic bass tones, crisply strummed acoustic guitar, and children's vocal choir come in at the start of opener You With Me, you could easily be forgiven for mistaking this for a deep cut on M83's Hurry Up We're Dreaming. But it's not long before the track and the album as a whole becomes recognizably Jimmy Eat World. The new sound is solidified on lead single Sure and Certain, one of the best singles the band had released in over a decade, displaying the sugar-sweet, shoegazy glide of the record at its most refined. The production also gives more straightforward Jimmy tracks like It Matters, Get Right, and You Are Free a size and edge that they hadn't really shown since Chase This Light. You also get more experimental shades of the band here too, as confident as ever in songs like the eerie dirge turned explosively muse-esque Pass the Baby, 
and the synth lead and radiant pretty grids as well as the lonesome unadorned horn balladry of the title track with a sentiment that shows defiance and self-love in the face of apathy from the world. Perhaps the best deep cut here is the short but sweet through with one of the album's strongest vocal melodies and some classic futures-esque energy. Closer Paul Roger ends the album perfectly, applying the rich and layered sonic landscapes the album has displayed to one of their most typically ascendant and uplifting finales on any record. As it reaches the crest of its near 7 minute runtime, it's impossible not to be reminded of why this band are as wonderfully lovable as they've always been, and it shows the spirit that has endeared them for more than two decades is far from lost. If you're whoa. I can only apologise to the diehards and the casuals who consider the band's commercial peak worthy of the top three at least, but as with Invented I have to preface this with the disclaimer that when I was first getting into the band, I didn't really feel much for this album at all. An opinion that seems bizarre to me now as deeply invested in this band as I ever have been. I never outright disliked this of course, but discovering that Jimmy Eat World were so much more than just the middle made it difficult to fully embrace this album for a while. However now, with the context of their entire discography, it's easy to recognise it for the deftly negotiated shift to pop appeal that it is a masterful refining of Clarity's expansive range to maximise the band's commercial appeal without losing the personality, flair, and outrageously good hooks that have always been a defining feature. The pop punk of a praise chorus, if you don't don't, the title track, and of course the middle, is among the sharpest the genre has ever produced. Hear You Me and My Sundown are gorgeously sad ballads that rank among my favourite songs the band have ever released, and the eternal sweetness will likely always be their most anthemic, intense, adrenaline pumping song, perhaps the greatest pop punk song of all time. Deep cuts like Your House and Cautioners stand out as growers on an incredibly tight album. The only real misfires are Get It Faster, which rubs me the wrong way with its irksome vocal refrains, and The Authority Song, which is the slightest and most irreverent thing here. Not a bad track, but also just not really fitting in as well with the songs that surround it. On the whole though, Bleed American holds up as an essential standard of both power pop and pop punk. As exciting 21 years on as it ever has been, and still a delight to discover, both heavier and more beautiful than you remember it being, and a strong entry point into this wonderful band. I've no doubt this will be the most controversial placement on this list, as Chase This Light seems widely denigrated as a cheap attempt at pop crossover success again after the heavier, more intense production of Futures, with many viewing the band's team up with Rick Rubin, hardly an emo icon, cynically. The thing that this take misses though is that Chase This Light fucking slaps. It's a bold take to name any opening track from this band their best, but Big Casino not only earns that title, it's also one of the best album openers of any rock record in the entire 2000s decade. Aside from maybe sweetness, the band have never sounded this fucking colossal, channeling an incandescent energy to blast one of their greatest choruses ever into the stratosphere. Many acknowledge this, but fewer acknowledge that the album by no means stops that energy there. Let It Happen and Always Be showcase pop sensibilities that rival the best moments of Bleed American, with a heft and scale to the production that will blast your speakers. Where the wordless vocal refrain of Bleed American's Get It Faster Left Me Cold, a similar technique is utilised to devastating effect on Carry You, while the title track remains one of the band's most enduring love songs in my estimation. In terms of simple pleasures, the band deliver blood pumping moments all round, with Electable being one of the most fun Jimmy songs to just blast on the car stereo and holler along to. It doesn't matter that it's essentially reusing the millennial whoop trick that Sweetness mastered, 
The sheer power here is just too much fun to deny. The comparatively maligned back half of this album packs some of my favourite deep cuts from this band as well, including the bouncy, hook-laden euphoria of Here It Goes, and the addictive surge of Firefight. Closer Dizzy essentially attempts to replicate the glory of Futures 23, but like with Electable, I simply don't care because the song is so immaculately crafted and impassioned that it's impossible to deny. Even if this record is essentially a slicker iteration of Futures, there are worse things a band can do in their prime than dole out another generous helping of what they do best. When the music is this much fun, you won't hear me complaining. Really, the top two couldn't be anything else, and I know a lot of Jimmy Eat World fans out there will agree. Futures is the most immense, immaculately produced in terms of balancing the band's characteristic prettiness with genuine, gritty, occasionally metallic heft, and crucially, the most timeless album this band have ever made. It's the easiest to throw on in the car, the easiest to jam out to, and the best balance of immediate, lasting hooks with instrumentals that feel genuinely cinematic and three-dimensional in a way that far expands the sticky and intimate sound of the two records that immediately precede it, elevating the sound of this band to stratospheric new heights. From its opening seconds, Futures breaks the fucking door down grabs you by the scruff of the neck and hurls you head first into the ride of your life. The fast paced stomp of Just Tonight is about as throttling and speedy as this band get and lead single Pain wastes no time in channeling the band's instincts for urgent, screamable hooks into pure gold. Kill is one of many songs in the band's discography about righteous emotion in the face of heartbreak, but few sound as genuinely anguished and powerful as this one does. Deep Cut Stand Out Nothing Wrong showcases this aggressive side to the band's sound with some of drummer Zach Lynn's most slamming, tight kit work, and it's positioned perfectly as a pick-me-up in the record's moodier second half. On that note, while being a total thrill ride of an album, Futures of course features plenty of dynamic range, and second single Work pulls back the throttle just a little without compromising the driving tone the album has established, and spacier back half cuts like Polaris and Night Drive give a taste of a band in touch with how to tune their dreamier instincts into fully realised, immersive, cinematic emotional experiences in a way that's not dissimilar to what Deftones do on my favourite album of theirs, 2012's Koi no Yokan. Slightly more divisive is centerpiece Drugs or Me, which is one of Jim's most direct, unadorned ballads that may read as mawkishly cheesy to some, but feel genuinely painful in a way that I think is very effective and will resonate with anyone who can relate to its devastating subject matter. All this is to say nothing of closing track 23, on some days the band's best song, and an utterly heartrending but equally uplifting and soaring embrace of running headfirst into the future, of imagining better for yourself and of refusing to be weighed down. It makes sense that the most triumphant Jimmy Eat World song rounds out the most thrilling Jimmy Eat World album, and it's a testament to the band that somehow this stellar record is not my number one. That title, of course, belongs to... There are very few albums that have come to mean quite as much to me as Clarity does. It's one of my five favourite albums of all time, and to call it the band's masterpiece is to sell it short with such a meaninglessly overused label. Clarity is not just the finest hour of Jimmy Eat World, it's the greatest emo album of all time in my estimation, certainly of the canonical classics. It displays a band so at the height of their powers that they sweat great songs, an embarrassment of riches with hooks, arrangements, vocal melodies, and just enough well-calculated experimentation to give the entire mix a special source uh, that makes it compelling on first listen and irresistibly intoxicating as it slowly begins to seep further into your life. 
especially compared to the record that immediately precedes it, but also amongst their entire catalogue, there's a grandiose sweep to the swelling structure here that is endearingly ambitious, and the band are so clear-headed and focused in their strengths that that ambition never escapes their meticulous creative control. Under the deftly attuned guidance of producer Mark Trombino, and a newfound sense of confidence and purpose in their most sophisticated and clearly realised batch of songs to date, Opener, Table for Glasses, is the kind of auspicious intro that marks any classic album. Surprisingly gentle, lilting, but promising in ways that Static Prevails could not have predicted. Lead single Lucky Denver Mint and subsequent rippers Your New Aesthetic and Believe in What You Want see the band grappling with the pressure to commercially succeed against the pressures of scene purity. With a Sunday's bright, twinkling melodies, warm organ tones, mournful strings and gentle electronics, the scope of this band widens further and these flourishes give colour and depth equally to ragers like Crush and Blister. Softer moments like Ten and my personal favourite Jimmy Eat World song, For Me This Is Heaven, show you the band at the peak of their emo powers, jangling picked melodies and gently pleading vocals, tasteful and devastating. Seven Minute Centerpiece, Just Watch The Fireworks, is some of the most irresistibly emotional music ever laid to tape as far as I'm concerned. The fiery breakup cry of the title track has some of the most lacerating riffs and vocals that this band has ever produced, and the titanic 16 minute closer Goodbye Sky Harbour is the kind of music you want to die to lifting the listener skyward in its hypnotic repetition and gently swelling extended coda. Clarity is the kind of album that can change your life if you encounter it in just the right moment. And even if it doesn't connect with you immediately, on the same bone deep level as it has with me, its treasures remain out there to discover and let yourself be pulled into away from where you are for as long as you want to be free. And that's it. My countdown of every Jimmy Eat World album from worst to best. Let me know what you think of this countdown. Let me know what your ranking is in the comments below as well. I want to see all of your rankings. I will be looking and reading through all of the comments and replying to as many as I can. And if you want more Jimmy Eat World content from this channel, we actually did a Record Club episode on Clarity, where we spoke for an hour about this album, breaking down the tracks more meticulously, and it got pretty emotional, needless to say. So if you're interested in checking that out, I'll make sure there's a link to it in the description of this video. But yeah, thank you for watching up to this point, and I hope to be back again soon enough with another discography breakdown. You can check out my last solo discography video, which was on the discography of my favorite musical act of all time, Orteker. I'll put a link to that in the description below as well. And there are other full discography breakdowns on this channel as well that you can check out too. Uh, we've done a whole bunch of bands, both solo and as a group, that I'm sure will give you hours of relentless entertainment. And with that, all that remains to be said is, of course, rock over London. Rock on Chicago, BMW, the ultimate driving machine.